Good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindi news analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 14th April 2021 The list of news articles chosen for today's analysis is provided here along with their page numbers in different editions of Hindi newspaper Now let us start our analysis with this first news article which talks about Indian Rhino Vision 2020 program See the news article mentions that two rhinos that is rhinoceros were translocated from Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary to Manas National Park in Assam and this was done under the guidance of the Indian Rhino Vision 2020 program most importantly this translocation marks the final operation under this program so this program has come to an end with this In this context it becomes important to know about this vision see this program is aimed at increasing the number and the range of rhinos in Assam this was to be achieved through wild to wild translocations from Kaziranga National Park and Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary to some potential protected areas in Assam and this program was established in the year 2005 it was a joint program of the Assam Forest Department World Wildlife Fund India Borderland Territorial Council and the International Rhino Foundation and many other organizations were also supporting this program now the vision of this program was to increase the total rhino population in assam from about 2000 to 3000 by the year 2020 another vision was to significantly ensure that these rhinos are distributed over at least seven protected areas this is to provide a long term viability of an assam meta population of rhino see a meta population in ecology means a regional group of connected populations of a species So in short the vision is to attain a population of 3000 wild rhinos in Assam that will be distributed over seven of its protected areas by the year 2020 Now what was the need for this program and this vision the main need was that there were major problems and setbacks in the conservation of rhinos in Assam See the first problem was around 85% of rhino population was restricted to Kaziranga National Park in Assam at that time so it exposed the species to stochastic risks that is random and unpredictable risks also sadly the species had been driven from many of the areas where it used to be found commonly then another problem was that the population in pobitora wildlife sanctuary exceeded its carrying capacity see here carrying capacity means the number of people animals or crops which a region can support without environmental degradation so in our context carrying capacity means the number of rhinos that pobitora wildlife sanctuary can support without degrading its environment if you remember day before yesterday we saw that pobitora wildlife sanctuary has exceeded its rhino bearing capacity and it is overpopulated because uh, around 90 plus rhinos are surviving on merely 16 square kilometer area So this made the Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary as the world's highest density of rhinoceros that is Indian rhinoceros so the population needed to be reduced to protect the habitat and it was also needed to mitigate the increasing rhino human conflicts that was occurring as the animals were moving into the agricultural areas then the next problem was a significant population of rhinos was exterminated in the Manas National Park during the 1990s this happened due to the poor law and order situation at that time in the region and also due to the ethnic conflicts now these affected the species in the region including the indian rhinoceros and this was one of the reasons why manas national park was uh, removed from the world heritage status see you should note that manas was given the world heritage tag and it was listed under the unesco world heritage sites list in the year 1985 but due to the situation in 1990s unesco inscribed it on the list in danger and this happened in the year 1992 see this list is nothing but the unesco's list of world heritage in danger and this list is uh, designed to inform the national community about the conditions which threaten the very characteristics of a property for which that property was inscribed on the world heritage list and this list is to encourage corrective action against such threatening issues So the list may include only such properties that form part of the cultural and uh, natural heritage and which are threatened by serious and specific dangers such as the threat of disappearance caused by accelerated deterioration of the biodiversity then major alterations due to unknown causes then the outbreak and the threat of an armed conflict calamities serious fires earthquakes etc etc so this was one of the problem regarding the conservation of uh, the rhinos in Manas National Park then another issue was that the population was reduced in some places or in some places there was even elimination of the species due to poaching 
especially it was reduced due to poaching in the Orang National Park and it was eliminated from the Lakhova National Park which once had 50 plus rhino population so these problems demanded conservation of the species especially there was a need to improve the security in all rhino areas in Assam there was a need to expand the distribution of rhinos to reduce the risk of stochastic catastrophes and natural calamities because as you know flood is an annual occurrence in the region and the intensity of the flood varies based on the monsoon rainfall received by the Brahmaputra flood plain if you even remember in 2020 the flood levels remained for nearly two months and they caused issues not only for the humans but also it affected the rhinos and the third need was that as we saw it was important to reduce the population in Povitora so that the species population remains within the ecologically and sociologically carrying capacity of the reserve see here uh, sociological carrying capacity is the number of rhinos that a protected area can sustain without significant human rhino conflict so now based on the visions which we saw in the beginning and based on these needs which we just saw there were two main objectives of this program the first objective was to improve the protection of rhinos in all the rhino areas now the second objective was translocating rhinos from two source populations into protected areas here translocation means the managed movement of a live indigenous plant or animal from one location to the another so here especially the rhinos were to be translocated from its two source populations that is from Kaziranga and Pobitora into three or four targeted uh, protected areas such as Manas region, Lakhova, Burracharpori, Kochmora region, Dibru Saikhova region and also possibly Orang region. So we can see that the objective was wild to wild translocations of moving the rhinos from densely populated parks to the ones that were in need of more rhinos. So these were the objectives, visions of the program. Now we saw that this program came to an end now. So was this program a success? Yes, it was. See, as of now, rhinos are found in four protected areas in Assam. Popitora Wildlife Reserve, Rajiv Gandhi Orang National Park, Kaziranga National Park and in the Manas National Park. So they are not only restricted to Popitora and Kaziranga. And secondly, in the 2018 and 2019 itself, there were significant decreases in poaching. And this was a result of coordinating efforts between the forestry officials, between the locals and the national government officials as they were combating wildlife crime across Assam. And the main success of this program is that the population of rhinos in the region is more than 3,600. So the target of 3,000 under the Indian Rhino Vision 2020 has been achieved. And most importantly, the program helped to reintroduce rhinos to one of its historical range area, that is the Manas National Park. And uh, note that Manas National Park was the first protected area under this program where the rhinos were reintroduced. And according to recent estimates, currently there are 49 rhinos in Manas National Park. Now here you should note that Manas National Park regained its UNESCO World Heritage Site recognition in 2011 itself because uh, in the beginning we saw that it was listed in the list of uh, World Heritage in Danger and it was put back into the world heritage list and a key factor that made this happen was this program and we saw that this program came to an end now only but the target was for 2020 and the target was delayed because the last translocation which happened now was originally scheduled for last year and it was delayed due to the global pandemic now there is one more benefit of this program which is that the translocated rhinos increase the genetic diversity of the manas population so it helps to achieve the goal of a natural and healthy breeding program for the future of the species. But apart from all this, the program has failed in one aspect, which is that it could not spread the Indian rhinoceros across all four protected areas beyond Kaziranga National Park and Pobitora. Because if you remember, we saw that its objective was translocating into three or four targeted protected areas and it failed in this objective. So even though there is a failure, it was able to achieve its main target of achieving the 3000 rhinos in Assam. And we can hope that the conservation efforts of the species will continue in the region. So these are some of the points that you need to know about the Indian Rhino Vision 2020. See, we have discussed about uh, Indian rhinoceros on our 12th April 2021 analysis. You can view that analysis also to know some factual details about the species. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article which is about the predictions made by a private weather forecasting company called SkyMet. This agency has predicted a healthy normal summer monsoon this year for India. 
that is the monsoon is likely to be 103 percentage of the long period average this year so in this context let us analyze this news article where we will discuss about the news about the long period average and what is this normal summer monsoon and we will also see the role of el nino and la nina in indian monsoon the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference so first let us see the predictions of skymet weather first prediction is that there will be 103 percentage of long period average and there will be a healthy normal summer monsoon see long period average of summer monsoon is the average of summer monsoon in india for a period of 50 years so with the data that is available up to 2010 we are using the long period average of june to september season from the years 1961 to 2010 so based on this the average that is the lpa comes at 88 cm and according to skymet's prediction we are expecting 90.7 cm of summer rainfall and this is what is 103 percentage of lpa so now what is the surety that this will happen according to the uh, predictions there are 60 percentage probability that it will be a normal monsoon so what is the meaning of the term normal here we say normal monsoon when the percentage departure of the realized rainfall is within plus or minus 10 percentage of the long period average and our long period average was 88 cm and the expected rainfall is 90.7 cm and this is within the 10 plus or minus percentage range and that is why it will be a normal summer monsoon for india So while it is predicted that normal rains are likely for the country particularly in the east and central parts the plains of north india and northeast region could be at some risk during the june to september according to the predictions now it has also made some forecast regarding el nino and la nina and here you can see that the neutral forecast probability to the tune of 68 percentage in june july august period and even in july august september period the neutral forecast probability is still prominent at around 56 percentage now the probability of la nina is 30 percentage or less than 30 percentage during uh, june july august september period and the probability of el nino is 12 percentage or less than 12 percentage during this same period so these are some of the predictions made by sky met weather so now why we are seeing predictions about el nino and la nina it is because they have a role to play in indian monsoon so first let us understand what are these el nino and la nina these are the terms related to the interactions between the atmosphere and ocean and these interactions occur in the tropical belt of the pacific ocean now these interactions are significant as they alter global weather and climate patterns so what happens in an el nino event here the sea surface temperature in the central and eastern tropical pacific ocean becomes substantially higher than normal even the news article notes that this event is characterized by a heating of over half a degree So this oceanic event of El Nino is associated with changes in pressure pattern in the southern oceans. Now these changes in the pressure pattern are called as southern oscillation and these El Nino and the associated southern oscillation is what is shortly called as Enzo. Now because of these changes in the pressure pattern and the atmospheric air circulation several regions in the world experience swings in their normal rainfall pattern. some regions receive lesser rainfall or even no rainfall and some regions even receive extreme rainfall therefore during el nino year we could see extreme consequences such as droughts as well as devastating floods so how this el nino affects india see whenever it is el nino it affects india's summer monsoon in june to september this is because el nino is associated with the weakening of trade winds and these trade winds are the ones which are the actual driving force of indian summer monsoon winds so if they weaken that means indian summer monsoon winds also weaken so in that sense el nino is associated with increased propensity of droughts like conditions in india and that is why news article states that an el nino is historically associated with a weakening of the monsoon over india in many years here just know that el nino typically occurs every 3 to 5 years we can also know about an interesting fact about el nino that is the origin behind the term el nino see this el nino term originated in 1800s at that time the fishermen on the pacific coast of south america noticed that a warm ocean current appears every few years so at that time the fish catches would drop drastically so this negatively affected the food supply and livelihood of the communities of coastal peru and more importantly this warm water would arrive around christmas time only and that is why they named the warm ocean waters as el nino because it referred to the birth of christ 
El Nino means the boy in Spanish. So this was about El Nino. But if you take La Nina, fishing in the Pacific Coast, South America is best during La Nina years. This is because the cold upwelling ocean water brings rich nutrients from the deep ocean and this results into an increase in the number of fish catches. So actually what is this La Nina? It is the cold phase of Enzo and it is the opposite of El Nino. In a La Nina event, the sea surface temperature in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean becomes lower than normal. So whenever it is La Nina, India experiences more rainfall and associated floods in some places. In addition to these two events, news article also mentions about the phenomenon called as Indian Ocean Dipole. See, Indian Ocean Dipole is the difference in sea surface temperature between two areas or poles and one of them is the tropical western Indian Ocean area and this area is called as the western pole in the Arabian Sea. Now the other is the tropical southeastern Indian Ocean area which is located south of Indonesia. And this IOD involves uh, oscillation of the sea surface temperature between positive and negative phases. In addition to this, there is also a neutral condition. So what this uh, positive phase means? It means cooling of waters in the eastern Indian Ocean. That is the western pole is warmer and the eastern pole is cooler. This leads to droughts in Indonesia region but it brings heavy rainfall to India. Now what happens in negative phase? In this eastern pole is warmer and western pole is cooler and this negative phase of IOD brings warmer water and greater precipitation in the eastern near equatorial Indian Ocean region. And this negative IOD during April May is what is associated with the early monsoon onset over Kerala. And a negative IOD during March to April period is said to have associated with enhanced seasonal summer monsoon rainfall over the peninsular India than over the central India and northern India. Here you should note that the positive IOD events are often associated with El Nino and the negative IOD events are often associated with La Nina. And it is reported that positive IOD event influences or it moderates the effect of El Nino event. That means despite El Nino, if there is a strong positive IOD, then it can lead to good monsoon rainfall in India. So these are some of the takeaways from this news article. We saw about the important predictions about Indian summer monsoon. We saw about El Nino, La Nina and also about Indian Ocean Dipole and their impact on the Indian monsoon. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on these two news articles. It talks about the government's decision to fast track the approvals for COVID-19 vaccines. And this is for the vaccines that have been developed outside India and that have been granted the emergency use authorization by the drug regulatory agencies outside India. The news articles also say that this emergency use authorization or in short EUA was given for Sputnik V vaccine of Russia and this is given by the Drugs Control General of India. So this paves the way for import and the use of Sputnik V to India but remember that its usage will be restricted to emergency situations as per the provisions of the new drug and clinical trials rules of 2019 which is under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. So in this context, let us have a brief understanding about emergency use authorization, then the drug regulator of India and also about Sputnik V. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. First, what is meant by emergency use authorization? See, generally for a drug or a vaccine to be used on a population, that is on people, it needs to undergo a rigorous preclinical and clinical trial. So here first the medicines are given to laboratory animals and they are tested. This is known as preclinical trials and then the clinical trials are conducted by testing the vaccine on humans and just know that these clinical trials consist of three phases that is phase one, two and three. So only after a drug passes all these three phases successfully it is administered to the general population. But this is a lengthy process and it takes a lot of time and usually it takes many years to complete the clinical trials. But in times of emergency or during a pandemic such as the one that is going right now several of these steps are needed to be bypassed. So it is under such circumstances that the health regulator of a country allows accelerated approvals of drugs under the emergency use authorization. So here it is to be remembered that this term EUA and the process is used by the United States Food and Drug Administration. So now what about India? See today's news article says that EUA is being given to Sputnik vaccine by India's drug controller. So in this context you should remember that India does not have an explicit EUA provision. However the new drugs and clinical trials rules of 2019 mentions about an accelerated approval process. 
So what this process means? It means depending on the severity of the disease, then depending on the urgency, rarity or the lack of alternative treatments, the regulator has the right to waive local clinical trials if a drug has been approved elsewhere. See, for example, the local clinical trials may be waived for approval in case of a new drug if it is approved and marketed in any of the countries such as European Union, United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, USA, etc. And among the clinical trial phases, phase 3 generally takes longer time. So if results from phase 1 and phase 2 are satisfactory, then phase 3 can be bypassed under the accelerated approval process. Also, during emergency situation, the Drug Regulator of India gives approval for a new drug through this accelerated approval process. So, who is the Drug Regulator for India? It is the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization, that is CDSCO. See, it works under the Directory General of Health Services in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and it derives its powers from the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. And this CDSCO is responsible for approval of drugs, it is responsible for conduct of clinical trials, and it also lays down the standards for drugs and most importantly know that CDSU is headed by the DGCA that is Drugs Controller General of India and that is why the news article mentions that DGCA has given EUA to Sputnik V. So what is this Sputnik V? So it is the vaccine of Russia and it is the world's first registered vaccine based on human adenoviral vector based platform. This vaccine uses a weakened virus to stimulate an immune response. Now here you should know that vectors are the vehicles which can induce a genetic material from another virus into a cell. So the gene from the adenovirus which is used as a vector here is removed. And in that place, a gene with the code of a protein from another virus spike is inserted. Now here this inserted element is safe for human body, but it still helps the immune system of a body to react and produce antibodies against the virus. And this in turn protects us from the infection. The human adenoviruses are considered as some of the easiest to engineer in this way. And therefore, they have become very popular as vectors. I know that according to sources, Sputnik V has an efficacy rate of 91.6%. So Sputnik V has the highest effectiveness after the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines of United States. So these are some of the points that you should know about emergency use authorization and also about Sputnik V. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this news article which states that the President of India has given assent to the Constitution Scheduled Caste Order Amendment Act of 2021. Now, This order puts seven sub six in Tamil Nadu under one nomenclature and this is done by amending the Constitution Scheduled Caste Order of 1950 which is amended by this amendment. Now this amendment was brought to modify the list of scheduled castes in the state of Tamil Nadu and note that this amendment order did not add or delete any name from the original original 1950 order. It has just reorganized few sects under a single name. So in this context, let us discuss about the news and also about how and who adds a community to the list of scheduled castes. In this regard, first it becomes important for us to know about Article 341 of Indian Constitution which deals with scheduled castes. This article states that the president may specify certain castes, races or tribes or parts of them or groups within them as deemed to be scheduled castes for the purposes of the constitution. And this is done in relation to a particular state or union territory. Now the president may do this through a public notification and when it is done for a state, the president may specify after consultation with the governor of that state. Now while exercising the power under clause 1 of this article, the then president of India had notified constitution scheduled castes order of 1950 and the constitution scheduled castes union territories order of 1951. So these are the primary or the first orders that were made as per clause 1 of article 341 for the states and UTs respectively. So what if there has to be some subsequent modification in the original order? Now for this know that the president is not empowered to modify the list like including or excluding a community or a part of the community from the original order. Here the original order is the 1950 and 1951 order. Now this is because of clause 2 of the article 341 which states that other than by a law of parliament, the original notification shall not be varied by any subsequent notification. So when there is a need to include or exclude a community into the list of scheduled castes, that is when there is a need to amend the 1950 and 1951 order, in that case only the parliament is empowered to do so. 
So now how this order is related to the current news? Now the parliament legislators wanted to change nomenclatures of certain sex or subsex in Tamil Nadu within the constitution scheduled caste order of 1950. Now even though there is no addition or deletion the changing of nomenclatures cannot be done by an order of precedent it is because as we just saw any variation in the original order made by the precedent can be done only by the parliament by law. that is parliament is only empowered to do all the variations in the original order so in the current case the amendment act groups around seven sex or subsex into a single nomenclature or a single caste name called as devendra kula vellalar just know that caste names or sect names such as devendra kulathan kudumban kaladi pannadi kadayan pallan vadiriyan all these caste names in specified districts are to be called as devendra kula vellalar from now on but interestingly the kadayan caste name in few other districts of tamil nadu are not to be called as devendra kula vellalar according to the amendment now there were requests from some members of the above castes to remove their caste names from constitution 1950 order but the parliament has only grouped the sects under one single name so experts are of the opinion that this development is the first step and in the future all these uh, seven groups will be removed from the list so these are some of the points that you should take from this article now let's move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this editorial article which is based on net zero emissions target and the editorial has been written by the experts in the field now this topic is under discussion because presently the us president's special envoy on climate is on a 3 day visit to india and this visit is ahead of the virtual climate leaders summit that will be convened by the us president and our prime minister is also one of the invitees to this summit and this summit assumes importance because us is expected to commit itself to a net zero emission target for the year 2050 at this summit and in addition to us even several other countries including united kingdom france european union canada south korea japan and germany have also expressed the intention to commit themselves also in a net zero emission target even china has promised to go net zero by the year 2060 but india which is also one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases has not yet made any such announcements or promises so the summit gives an opportunity for both sides to discuss climate change cooperation and the balance between near term priorities and long term targets in this light this editorial has been written so let us discuss what is this net zero target and we'll also see india's stance and approach towards this the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first what is net zero see it is a state in which a country's emissions are compensated by absorption and removal of greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere here absorption is done by creating more carbon sinks such as forests and removal of greenhouse gas requires future technologies like carbon capture and storage see if the absorption and removal limit exceed the actual emissions limit then the country is said to have a negative emission for example our neighbor bhutan is described as carbon negative since it absorbs more greenhouse gases than it emits but there is an issue with this net zero because it presents a challenge for the fast growing or developing countries as these countries need the carbon space to develop when you take especially india we need to work on a higher growth or development so as to lower our country's poverty rate and due to this the emissions are likely to grow rapidly in our country in the next 2 to 3 decades because we need industrial development for achieving growth and development of our country and this industrial development unfortunately leads to greenhouse gas emissions so in such a scenario india cannot ensure afforestation or even reforestation as a guarantee and india cannot also guarantee carbon removal technologies see even though india cannot guarantee these but india is still taking measures to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions and it is taken measures for afforestation or reforestation and for using carbon removal technologies but it cannot guarantee because if it is guaranteed then india has to do it and this is one of the reasons why india has not yet committed itself to the net zero target by 2050 so based on this there are debates going on whether india should commit itself or india should not and this debate is centered around two alternative strategies one strategy is to delegitimize the long term targets that is more focus should be on uh, measurable near term progress and priorities because the long term goals for the year 2050 and beyond may not be reliable and it may not be meaningful in terms of progress simply if you take the example of pandemic 
every measure for the betterment of human kind for the betterment of environment or the world as a whole has come to a halt because of the pandemic so similarly if we set a target too far then it may not be meaningful to achieve in the long run and in this regard you should know that india is a signatory to the 2015 paris agreement and this agreement does not talk about net zero goal and it only requires signatories to take the best climate action by setting and achieving 5 to 10 year climate targets for themselves it only mentions that such subsequent targets should be more ambitious than the previous one so there are arguments that long term goals like this may not materialize now the next is uh, other strategy as per this without long term targets the path to decarbonization will have little certainty or in simple words they are saying that short and long term goals are inseparable so for example if you want to mitigate emissions then planning should start at the local level and also it should be a short term based plan and only if these short term based plans are formulated and achieved we can able to achieve the long term plans so the long term plans rely upon the short term plans according to the proponents of this idea so now having this information in mind let us now discuss india's approach in this regard see presently renewable energy targets then improvements in energy efficiency and fast penetration of electric vehicles are some of the india's major low carbon objectives but these advances alone cannot reduce the emissions to net zero but still these advances cannot be avoided otherwise it will portray india to be a lethargic country and a country that is slow in its initiatives so what author suggests is that india should reframe the net zero debate from the perspective of climate justice that is to ensure equity that is all countries should assume fair responsibility based on their past and future emissions because such a move helps economic advancement and it also ensures climate responsibility to go hand in hand so in this regard author has certain proposals so you should note that world bank classifies a high income economy as the one with gross national per capita income of $12,536 or more in the 2019 prices so based on this author proposes a new formulation that combines per capita income and aggregate emissions as per this author expects these countries to take 15 to 20 years to achieve net zero emissions from 2020 onwards So now keeping this in mind if you view from the perspective of European Union or the US then we can say that they can reach net zero by their 2035 to 40 because they are already in the high income economy category but if you see USA and European Union have proposed to achieve net zero only by 2050 and then if you take India India is expected to become a high income economy around 2050 only so India should target net zero close to 2070 only as per author suggestion but however this per capita income should not be taken as an excuse for failing to correct the emissions intensive development pathways and this is applicable to every country so in this regard india should be careful and even though we have ample time left we should be cautious and work towards our short term priorities and also long term goals this is because as pointed out by the author aggregate emissions also matter so these countries who are not yet in high income category should aim for progressively smaller emissions than what the high income status countries aim by doing so we can ensure sustainable development priorities and we can also create the conditions for future innovation and investment in a climate friendly infrastructure climate friendly technologies business models lifestyle and behavioral changes so as a conclusion author asserts that both short term and long term targets are essential for carrying out the necessary actions promises and it is necessary to create incentives for the markets to respond to climate related measures therefore authors also opine that instead of debating on the targets the real debate should be about climate justice for people and the planet and in this regard india should work towards alternative formulations that establish equity decide action and at the same time india should also be progressive in its ambitions So these are the points that you can take note from this editorial article. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Next news article mentions that the Competition Commission of India has decided to investigate into the new privacy policy of WhatsApp, and CCA has noted that this decision was made to assess whether the access to data by WhatsApp leads to abuse of dominant position. Further, CCA also accused WhatsApp to have the potential for excessive data collection and the sharing of data in an anti-competitive context. 
But however, according to WhatsApp, the issue with respect to user data and its sharing was already before the Supreme Court. Hence, the Competition Commission of India or CCI should not have intervened. So in this context, it becomes important for us to discuss about the Competition Commission of India or CCI. See, it is a statutory body as it was established under the Competition Act of 2002. And this act was amended by the Competition Amendment Act of 2007. Now, the main goal of this commission is to create and sustain fair competition in the economy that will provide level playing field to the producers and it will make the markets to work for the welfare of the consumers. So, the act prohibits anti-competitive agreements, it prohibits abuse of dominant position by enterprises and it also regulates acquisition which causes or which is likely to cause an adverse effect on the competition within India. Now coming to the composition of CCI, know that it consists of a chairperson and six members who are appointed by central government. Now the chairperson and every other member should be a person of ability, integrity, special knowledge and professional experience of not less than 15 years and this experience should be in areas like international trade, economics, business, commerce including competition law and policy. And know that the chairperson and the members are appointed based on the recommendations of a selection committee which is headed by the Chief Justice of India or a nominee of Chief Justice of India. Now both the chairperson and every other member of the team holds office for a term of five years provided that they have not attained the age of 65 and they are also eligible for reappointment. So that is all about CCI. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Now we have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. Now this is a previous year question that was asked in UPSC prelims 2017 and it is about Indian Ocean Dipole. The question asks, with reference to Indian Ocean Dipole sometimes mentioned in the news while forecasting Indian monsoon, which of the following statements is or are correct? First statement is, IOD phenomenon is characterized by a difference in sea surface temperature between tropical western Indian Ocean and tropical eastern Pacific Ocean. Now, first half of this statement is correct. It is characterized by a difference in sea surface temperature. But it is not between western Indian Ocean and uh, eastern Pacific Ocean. Rather, it is between tropical western Indian Ocean area and the tropical southeastern Indian Ocean area. That is why it is named as Indian Ocean Dipole. So this statement is incorrect. Now the second statement is an IOD phenomenon can influence an El Nino's impact on the monsoon. Now this statement is correct. We saw this during discussion that positive IOD events are often associated with El Nino and negative IOD events are often associated with La Nina. And the positive IOD event influences or moderates the effect of El Nino event. So if there is a El Nino and there is also strong positive IOD, then it can lead to a good monsoon rainfall in India. So here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option B, two only. Now this next question is a two statement question. First statement is, in the El Nino event, the sea surface temperature in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean becomes substantially higher than normal. Now this statement is correct. This defines the El Nino event. Now the second statement is, in monsoon related terminologies, long period average refers to average of summer monsoon rainfall in India for a period of 40 years. Now this statement is incorrect because long period average is for 50 years and currently we use the data of 50 year period from 1961 to 2010. And based on this, the LPA of the summer rainfall season of the country comes to be 88 centimeters. And here the question again asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option A, one only. Now this next question is based on Central Drug Standard Control Organization. First statement is it comes under the administrative jurisdiction of Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. Now this statement is incorrect because it comes under the Directorate General of Health Services which is in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now, the second statement is it derives its power from the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. Now this statement is correct. Now the third statement is in emergency situations it gives approval for a new drug bypassing clinical trials by using the explicit emergency use authorization provision mentioned in the new drugs and clinical trials rules of 2019. Now this statement is incorrect because during discussion itself we saw that India does not have an explicit EUA provision. However, the 2019 rules mention an accelerated approval process through which the CDSCO can give approval for a new drug by bypassing the clinical trials. Now be careful, the question asks for the incorrect statements. So the correct answer is not two only, rather it is option B, one and three only. 
Now this next question asks who among the following has the power to include in or exclude from the list of scheduled castes specified in the constitution scheduled caste order of 1950. Option A president of India, option B governor of a state, option C state legislature of the concerned state, option D the parliament. And the correct answer is option D the parliament because even though the first order for listing of scheduled castes for the states had been notified by the president under clause 1 of article 341 but any subsequent variation can be made only by a law of parliament as per clause 2 of the article 341 and that is why correct answer is option d now this next question is based on competition commission of india first statement is it is a statutory body responsible for enforcing the competition act of 2002 now this statement is correct now the second statement is it is chaired by the union minister of consumer affairs food and public distribution now this statement is incorrect The chairman of the commission is an eminent person appointed by the central government and it need not be the union minister of consumer affairs. Now the third statement is consumer welfare and effective competition advocacy are some of its objectives. Now this statement is also correct. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option C 1 and 3 only. Now let us take this mains question. It is a 10 marks question. You have to answer this in 150 words. You can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis and the practice questions discussion session. If you like this video don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation. Happy new year to my fellow Tamilians and viewers from Kerala. இனிய தமிழ் புத்தாண்டு நல்வாழ்த்துக்கள் மற்றும் விஷு ஆசம்சகள்.